From the very first days of Holly & Co, when it was just myself, Carrie and Gabby sitting in my bedroom dreaming up what Holly & Co would become, we had a mood board. We'd refer to it often and on it was none other than Sophie Salou, founder of Grain & Knot. She was in fact in our first brand film back in 2017. So I think it's safe to say I've long been a fan. Sophie has such passion for her wood carving and has found an incredible way of blending both ancient and modern crafting techniques to create something completely magical and unique. You can literally feel the love and care she's poured into each product. It's safe to say that the idea of building and consuming slowly comes through loud and clear. It was brilliant to chat to someone who believes in being thoughtful as much as myself, whilst making a successful and commercial business. I felt totally inspired and calm after talking to Sophie, and I hope you do too. Here is our conversation of inspiration. Bow your head and let your eyelids close on down Where we're going you won't need to bring your frown I'm Holly Tucker and welcome to Conversations of Inspiration. Back in 2006, I founded Not On The High Street from the kitchen table and since then I've gone on to launch Holly & Co. I'm the UK ambassador of Creative Small Businesses and I believe that having a business doing what you love is the key to a happy, fulfilled life. My dream is to help everybody start theirs. I'm here to offer advice, inspiration, wisdom and encouragement and in my view, the best way to do this is by sharing stories. So I've reached out to my favourite small businesses, entrepreneurs and those who simply inspire me and asked them to share theirs. With thanks to NatWest, who have helped bring this free podcast to life. Here are my conversations of inspiration. Sophie, we were just saying how crazy this is that you've been part of the Holly & Co journey since day one, appearing on our first video when we launched, and yet you and I have still not met in person. How has that happened? I don't, I don't know how that's not <laughs> happened yet. Well, we slightly know how it's happened in the last year. Yes. And, and certainly we've had more contact this year because, uh, well, last year, because you won the Modern Crafter Awards at our very first independent awards in December. And I'm still so <laughs> thrilled for you. I know. I, honestly, it still hasn't really sunk in yet. Like, it's still sort of a bit of a dream. I don't know how so much time has passed since then either. It's crazy, isn't it? And I saw your beautiful Instagram post because we haven't spoken since then where we sent you the award what yes. did you think of that oh, it's beautifully it so engraved nice. isn't it so just why don't you describe it it fits perfectly into my workshop it's just you know it's wooden it's perfect it's um yeah I've got it hung up on my wall in my workshop so it's a, a nice reminder every day on this podcast, we start right at the beginning. And I, I wanted to ask you, when you think about yourself, uh, the little Sophie, did you always have an artistic streak or did you always find yourself outside? I was always one of those children that was making things. We had a, it was called the craft pot. It was a huge um, terracotta plant pot in our dining room. And that's where we kept all the craft supplies. Oh, yeah. So it was like, oh, Sophie's in the craft pot again. <laughs> like, you know, any bits of ribbon or, you know, paper, anything I was always making. I was always sat in my room alone quite a lot as well, just enjoying making things or sat outside collecting things and making things from that. So I think it was very early on. I've always been drawn to making and doing things with my hands. And so then you followed this passion because you attended the Manchester School of Art. What did you study there? I studied interior design. I joined in about 2006 and graduated in 2009. So it was actually a really tricky time because it was, you know, we graduated mid-recession. Mm -hmm. As much as I loved the course, I kind of knew quite quickly that it wasn't what I wanted to do. Uh, it just wasn't hands on enough for me, gave me some great skills and I met loads of amazing people. But it was um, and it was just such a fun, exciting place to be as well. I absolutely love Manchester. I've not ever lived there, but we've done uh, various things. We did a podcast live there and all these things. And it's an incredible place. So interiors interested you? Yeah, again, this is shows how much TV I watched when I was younger but I think it was the sort of changing rooms days I loved it and I just wanted to 
I just, yeah, I was obsessed with it. And it was one of those things that I just was like, I really want to make these amazing spaces. Mm. I think at the time when I was younger, I really wanted to be a property developer and I wanted to make these huge, grand, like beautiful buildings. But alas, the finances didn't quite stretch that far. <laughs> what was it like when you left uni? You didn't quite know, did you, what the next stages were? And, and during that time, you started working in retail at Selfridges I and did, then yeah. a visual merchandiser and concept designer for Jack Wood. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that stage and, and actually then what led you on to your passion of woodwork? So we were sat down at uni and told that this wasn't a viable career option right now. Not helpful. Not helpful at all. <laughs> so they sort of said, you know, realistically, you need to find a different path because there's no work for you. So it almost felt like a bit of a kick in the teeth. You know, we've just spent this last three years, all this money and all this time on something that, you know, we, we can't get a job in. So because I loved Manchester so much, I just applied for as many retail jobs as possible because I just wanted to stay there. I wasn't ready to move back to London mm -hmm. yet. Mm -hmm. And I started working in a small vintage shop and quickly realised that I actually really liked doing the window displays and doing the, the visual displays in the shop. So I started doing that more and more. After two years, I moved to a company called Auburn and Wills, mm -hmm. who were the older sister brand to Jack Wills. So that was my first sort of visual merchandising retail official role and I worked within Selfridges yes. in Manchester I worked across the two Selfridges in Manchester and quickly moved on to be part of the visual merchandising team and actually ended up opening about eight stores across the UK within a year wow I absolutely loved it you know I was in store every day making these beautiful displays working with beautiful clothes that were British made it really was like a really exciting job and um before I moved to Jack Wills, Auburn and Wills actually shut down. The whole company closed. So um, I applied for a job within their head office for Jack Wills and got it. And that's where the concept design started. So I moved back to London, moved back home with my mum and dad. From there, started working with their concept design team. Quickly realised that it wasn't for me at all. Working in an office wasn't for me. It was quite a tricky time. And not only that as well, on a, on a personal note, I don't really talk about this too much, but my family was going through a really difficult time. My dad was going through a trial and court case, which ended up in him being wrongly convicted and imprisoned for two and a half years. My goodness. Yeah, it was a really difficult time. So, you know, I moved, I, I had a redu one redundancy. I moved back home. I was helping to support my family. Uh, I was driving to prison visits, you know, three hours away each way. You know, my head was about to explode. I was like, I need to do something that I enjoy because I didn't enjoy my work. My home life was really difficult and I just wanted to use my hands. So I started going on lots of different creative courses. So, you know, one day workshops doing such an array of things. I did weaving. I did this. It was called paper engineering. And, you know, it was like origami and folding things and just being in all these different workshops and workspaces was so exciting I remember chatting to one of my colleagues at the time and we were working on a homeware concept and just looking at all these really beautiful images on Pinterest and we kept seeing this like really beautiful handmade wooden homeware and I was like, I would love to try that. Like, I just want to give it a try. And she turned around to me and said, oh, have you heard of this company that run workshops? And I think that was a Tuesday. And by the Saturday, I was on that course and instantly hooked. We just spent the day in the woods carving, learning about trees. We built a fire. We had coffee over a fire. And it was just, I think it was just everything I'd been missing. It was nature. It was using my hands. It was using, you know, natural materials. And it was also making something useful, which stuck with me for a really long time. But um, yeah, it was just one of those things that I just grabbed hold of and went with it with everything I had. The course had such an impact on you that the very next day you bought an axe. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm yeah, very glad it's I not know. like anger here. <laughs> but, you know, an axe and a set of knives, you know, and you could just imagine your mum opening the door and just thinking, uh, Honestly, what is this all about, what Sophie? What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> but you basically had found, you know, I refer to it as a diamond and it brought a smile to your face and it made you want to get out of bed in the morning. Mm -hmm. Did you know that you wanted to turn it into a business there and then? Um, no. So I think I've always known when I remember working in just working in any job, I always give it 100%. Like I always work as hard as possible. And that's definitely something that I've learned from my parents. And I just, you know, I really just wanted to work for myself. And if put 100% into 
my own project, but I never knew exactly what that was. And um, I set up an Instagram account just to track my progress and meet like-minded people and see other carvers and see what they're up to and connect with all these people worldwide. And I called it Grain and Knot because it was wood. I was like, yeah, that works. <laughs> there really wasn't that much thought. It genuinely was just a project and it was somewhere I could track what I was doing. And it wasn't until towards the end of my concept design role, um, which I ended up being made redundant from again. So it was two redundancies in the space of two years. Mm. But I remember chatting to a friend and she was like, oh, you could, you know, why don't you think about selling them? And I was like, no, no one's going to want to buy them. You know, it's just, I enjoyed doing it. And also I didn't really want to give them away. It was just something I, I liked. Yeah. But um, when we did get made redundant, a friend of mine, who a colleague who I'm still really close with, and she said, have you heard of the Prince's Trust? And I was like, yeah, I've heard of that. But, you know, I'm never really thought about going on the course. And again, it was one of those things that I decided to do really quickly. And I was able to get on the course extremely quickly after being made redundant. And I did the enterprise in the city scheme. I called them up and they were like, we have a course starting next week. If you're available, we've got one space. Wow. And I was like, I'll be there. I think that at the time they normally say leave about six to eight months to complete it. And I did it in about four weeks because I was like, I, I know what I want to do. And so I completed their course. I wrote my business plan and by the Christmas, I was already in a Christmas market and I'd won some funding for them to set up my workshop. So it was a really quick turnaround from being made redundant to launching my first market was about six months. It's incredible. And I love that you went through the Prince's Trust. It is such an amazing organisation. I'm very proud to be a patron for Women Supporting Women. Amazing. They've helped over 86,000 young people start their own business. Wow. And I know firsthand, and you do as well, it helps people turn their dreams, who might not be able to, as you said, get the funding to start. And that's what happened. You got this bit of funding. You were in the market. You were ready. You did your business, but you did the whole thing in four months. You, did did, you just I, did I, it. Yeah, it was crazy. And am I right in saying that one of the first things that you did was that you actually took your spoons to a Liberty Open Call? Was that daunting? <laughs> Yeah, it was quite scary. It was also just quite exciting because I'd been in the retail environment before. Yeah. I kind of had an understanding of it. And the lady that I met was really lovely and it didn't go anywhere at that time, but it was actually really valuable. She mentioned things about, you know, that I'd not really thought about at that point. She was talking about packaging. She was talking about the provenance of the timber because, some, you know, somewhere like Liberty, they need to know exactly where it's from. They need to know exactly where the, you know, the finishing oils, where that's from. And I was sort of like, oh, yeah, like, of course you do. Like, you know, it's not, <laughs> you can't just hand over an item and it be, you know, sold to all these people. So actually, you know, it didn't go anywhere, but I just really enjoyed talking to someone. And it also... One of the things that they, t you know, that I learned from the Prince's Trust was they were like, you just need to be talking about your product all the time. Like you never know who you're going to meet. So you need to be able to talk about it really well and show that passion for what you're doing. So just being able to go and speak to this buyer and talk to her about my work was actually, it was quite exciting. Tell me about what you might give as some advice for people turning that spoon in the bedroom carving into an actual business? What were those key things? You mentioned one there, which was talking about it. So, you mm. know, that was something. Were there other things that you learnt that would be a good piece of advice for those listening? Finding your own personal style is really important. And it's something that's taken me quite a long time to develop. I think um, one of the problems that you see nowadays is that because someone sees something on Instagram, they feel like it's fair game just to repeat. And it's quite obvious and quite often those businesses don't last. So it's, um, I think it's just really important to find your own personal style, whether that's in the product that you're making or the way that you shoot your work or just the way that you portray yourself online as well is really important. And just, you know, really being passionate about it and learning as much as possible as, as you can in that particular field. And um, one other thing that's been really important for me is uh, connecting with other creatives and like-minded individuals and creating this sort of community. One thing I missed was that I didn't have any colleagues. Yeah. I, you know, I was here doing this on my own and it did get quite lonely at one point and it was sort of like... You know, you get in your own head and you're there sat in my bedroom making stuff. And I'm like, this is rubbish. No one's going to like it. You know, like, what am I doing? I'm just sat here making spoons. <laughs> like, this isn't, this isn't going to get me very far. But um, 
you know, then, you know, meeting other creatives and finding sort of inspiration from them and getting encouragement from their words as well is so important. It it helps you feel like you're A, not alone, but B, I can imagine you just got a lot of encouragement that you got people, you know, definitely uh, telling you that what you were doing was beautiful. You know, it's just those, as you said, you don't have colleagues, do you, when you're alone? You don't have someone to pat you on the back or give you a hug or give you a high five, you know, all those. Just share ideas with as well. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And also, I, I know that you you were a firm believer of starting small, that you gave yourself sort of six months to to do this. And, and do you think that was important as well for yourself just to go, actually, I'm, I'm not going to waste my life on this if this isn't going to work? Yeah, I think um, another going back to the sort of family aspect of it as well, like both my parents are medical. So moving into a like a steady career, into something that was so unknown, you know, like selling my work via Instagram. Like it was very much sort of like they were worried that it wasn't going to amount to anything. And they, you know, they sort of said, is, you know, is this the right path? And, in, you know, it wasn't in a stifling way. It was just like, you know, this might not work. And I totally agreed with them. So from being, I think from the Princess Trust course, I said, right, if I'm not selling my work in six months then I will look for a job and luckily I you know I was living at home I you know all I was paying for was my car insurance and petrol and my my phone so I you know I have no dependents nothing so I was like if I don't do this now I'm never going to do it but I also have a really small amount of money from my redundancy pay and I don't want to just blow it all on everything Mm -hmm. I think I started uh, with two and a half thousand pounds from the Prince's Trust from a low-cost loan from them I just didn't see the point of you know, spending loads of money doing something. You know, I built my own website using Squarespace. I I did everything, you know, I've had friends that were graphic designers. I roped in favours, like doing all sorts. And, you know, even the photography, I roped a friend into helping me with at the beginning. Like I just wanted to keep it small. And also, which has worked out quite well for me, is I'm a very selfish worker. Like I think when I... um. I, I didn't want to give too much away. Like, I, you know, what, what my friend who was a graphic designer gave me all these options and I was like, oh, I actually have this idea of something that I want and it's... I'll just do it myself. I, yeah, exactly. And I was like, this is exactly what I want if you can just draw that up for me <laughs> rather than taking on your options. So, um, you know, there was only so much I was able to do. So that just sort of forced me to keep it small anyway. NatWest have helped us bring you conversations of inspiration since day one, and it's hard to believe we're fast approaching our 100th episode. Not only empowering small businesses to share their own story on this very podcast, but with a continued commitment to supporting founders through the pandemic, they joined us to bring you SME SOS, and most recently, Campaign Shop Independent. They truly do believe in the power of small. Now, as you know, every week we give away an ad break to small businesses. We're passionate about amplifying the voices of those who run their own enterprises across the UK. So without further ado, here's this week's independent ad break winner. Hi, I'm Maisie Manners and I hand make sustainable crossbody bags. The inspiration behind making these bags was simple. I wanted to create something that was sustainably sourced, durable, unisex, and most importantly, genuinely useful. These bags are made in really small quantities using what fabrics I can find, from dead stock dealers to small secondhand scraps on eBay. I wanted to slow down fast fashion and make our belongings a little more meaningful. For me, the bags that I make are all about the connection to the maker. And that's why I always share the making process with everyone online too. Come meet me if you're interested to find out what they look like. Search the handle Maisie Manners Made on either Etsy or Instagram. That's M-A-I-S-I-E, Manners Made. Thanks for listening. For your chance to have your very own independent ad break and be heard by tens of thousands of listeners, there's more on what we're looking for at holly.co. Now, let's get back to our conversation of inspiration. Your brand is so beautiful and it's so strong as a brand. It feels so harmonious. It's a joy to look at. The photography is just so beautiful. You know, you have your hand elements, the carving, you have your workshop. 
it's very cohesive. I suppose that's the word I'm trying to get to. It's very, very cohesive. And you touched on that fact that you've got to build a brand, a look, a style that is uniquely yours. Did you plan to evolve this brand into the way it looks now or has it sort of morphed into it? That's so kind. Thank you. No, it just sort of, it, to be honest, it really just evolved naturally. I think there's always things that I've been drawn to and, you know, my photography style is just something that I've played around with for a really long time until I've got something that I was happy with. And I mean, I always say this, but I never really make plans. I just sort of try things and see what happens. And, I'll, you know, I tried out various ways of shooting and if they don't work or for whatever reason, I'll try something else. So it's, I think, you know, there are, there are elements of research and looking into other elements of design that I was, you know, drawn to, but in a way, it just sort of, it just happened naturally and almost by accident. And I can imagine also that you have quite a following now. So you, the more followers that you got, the more comments saying, God, I love that. I love what you're doing here. Or could you do this more? Or that must have been definitely fueled to know that you were on the right path. And I think that's what a lot of people use Instagram for, almost like validation, I suppose. Yeah, the validation and the recognition of actually you're doing something that people like was yeah, it was really good. I remember um, the first few markets I did that were local to my mum and dad's house. I think, you know, the first market I probably sold two things and was absolutely thrilled. But I remember people coming up to me and sort of, you know, looking at my stuff, picking up a spoon and being like, you do know you can buy this in Ikea for a pound, don't you? And it would just be like, oh, like, you know, like, yeah. the, the, <laughs> here the I go stab again. to the chest and just like, OK, well, you're not my market. You know, you're not my audience and that's fine. But it was also like finding your audience and finding those people that did appreciate it and didn't mind spending the money on a sort of handmade item that would last a lifetime. So it was um, there were definitely challenges. That is something that I have heard from the community, as I said, for a huge amount of time. You know, this justification of the time, the effort, the love, the expense that goes into a handmade item versus the IKEA, the Amazon. Tell me how you dealt with that. And you must have now become quite well versed in what you say. And it would just be wonderful because I think a lot of people, you wish you'd said that. You think, oh gosh, that's a great thing to say after. But actually at the time, it can take you by surprise. It really did actually. And, you know, I would get quite defensive and sort of, you know, I think it's just telling people, well, actually, you know, this timber's come from, and at the time as well, I think one of the first places I got timber from was I bought a load of old bits of furniture off eBay. And so I made, you know, my first objects from broken furniture. So it was um, explaining to them about, you know, where I've sourced the materials from and actually it's taken me this long. And one of the things I used to say was, well, you know, you know, your uh, pots and pans in your house and your crockery, like, do you spend any money on that? And they were like, yeah, I mean, I've got a pan that was 60 pounds or, you know, and that's going to, but that's going to last me a lifetime. And I'll like, say, well, you know, why have you got a one pound spoon then? Like if you really enjoy cooking and you really enjoy the process, why not elevate that experience and have a spoon that would every day that you'll use it is just like, it's a joy to use. It's, you know, it's beautifully tactile. It's something that you can just enjoy using in the same way that you're, you know, you enjoy your favourite plate or your favourite yeah. mug or yeah. something, you know? Yeah. You know, everyone's got an, a piece of Ikea furniture. You go into everyone's house, they've got something. And especially recently, with the fact that everyone is spending so much more time at home, people are aware of the fact that they would like that unique thing or they would like that, you know, that object that would just brighten their day, even just slightly. So it's... um. I remember she'd passed away by the time I started doing this, but my my mum has stories of my grandma who's Italian, who was Italian and of her having wooden spoons that were handmade and that were passed down through her family. So it's wow. it's almost, it's really nice that it's almost yes. gone full circle and I know that she would have loved it, but um, it's just, and then even, you know, everyone has a story about a wooden spoon. Like even my, my, uh, my uncle always said, oh yeah, you know, when I was naughty, when I was younger, she'd used to beat me with, you know, <laughs> she'd used to chase me around the kitchen with those wooden spoons spoons and it's just it's just so funny that if you ask anyone that you know they normally have a story about a wooden spoon you're whether so it's, right yeah whether it's about being chased around the kitchen or a, a, a favorite meal that they used to help cook with and they used to love stirring and things when they were little so it is I think it's a really nice object and it's also the fact that it's useful but it's 
a spoon, which drew me to making them the most, is the first tool that you use mm. as a human. I hadn't thought of that. I think that really drew me to it as well, you know. It's the first thing you pick up and actually physically use. And as you said, as a human, it's universal, it's the globe. Tell me about this, though. You went onto Instagram, but you kept your identity under wraps mm-hmm. for two years. Yeah. Tell me why you did that. Um, with everything that was going on with my family at the time, I wanted an escape. So it was sort of like, this is mine, but it's not, I didn't want it to be related to, you know, the troubles that my family was having. But also I was very aware that I wasn't the normal type of person that would go into this field. I was very aware that it was seen as an old white man's hobby, if you Mm -hmm. put it quite bluntly. Even when I'd get emails, it was hello, sir. You know, no one knew that I was female. I really did just want, to be honest, I really just wanted to focus on the product and everything else was irrelevant in my eyes. It didn't matter who made them. It was just quite important to me to have no distractions from that. And isn't it interesting how people, what is it with us humans? The negative comes first. Yeah, so rather than saying how great to have you as part of our community, you know, we don't often see a female coming along wanting to carve spoons. Great. What is that? And do you think that that has now shifted since you've started or do you think it's still alive? I think one of the reasons why there was such a pushback is because it was such a traditional thing to be doing and it does date back for you know hundreds of years so I think that anyone that does want to challenge that it could be seen as being disrespectful to the craft right and I can totally understand that but I think that technology changes oh and has changed so even just in the past 10 years it's changed so rapidly so why can craft not change and I think um One of the reasons that people were so upset was because, you know, it's a bit technical, but using green words, so freshly chopped down trees rather than reclaimed and pieces of, you know, old bits of firewood and whatnot that I use, I was using machinery to cut it. So I have a bandsaw that cuts out the wood, which speeds up the process because I can't physically do that Mm -hmm. with an axe. And um, and also uh, uh, from a business point of view, it takes me less than a minute to cut out a piece of wood with a bandsaw, yet it could take me 45 minutes to cut it with an axe. So it's like, I was like, well, I need to sell these. So I need to be making them quicker. But, um, you know, the sort of traditional, the Luddite version of that is that I'm, you know, it's not handmade because I'm not doing every part with my hand. And it didn't make any sense to me because it's like, but my hand is using the machinery. I use one piece of machinery to speed up a process Yeah, it was a bit difficult at first, but actually now it is the way that most people who have this as their sort of, you know, full time job, most people use a bandsaw to speed up the process just because it's makes sense. I was so interesting when um, I think it was Sir Tim Smith spoke about the land and how he so finds it very difficult. I mean, he used much stronger language than I'm using right now. Um, <laughs> he finds it very difficult to deal with people who don't want the land to change. But he says, well, this land, every single dot of land has changed in the last hundred years. So what do you, you know, it evolves. Of course, you need the land yep. to change with the times. Um, in 2018, and 19 you co-curated an event called Carve London yes firstly I love the name (laughs) this was a way that you basically brought together woodworkers maybe not some of the ones we've just spoken about and sharing skills and ideas and you sort of created this community of crafters I suppose for the 21st century was the motivation behind it because of the conversations we were just speaking about or was it to encourage people to sort of go on the same journey that you'd been on it was definitely a bit of both. It was um, partly because I knew that the majority of woodworkers do work alone. And you sort of see these um, group workplaces, such as like these amazing pottery studios and everyone's friends. And it's such a lovely environment. But it's very rare to have that in this field. You know, you're very much on your own. Yeah. And I was really aware of that. I mean, one of the first people that I followed on Instagram was Barn the Spoon because he's such a huge inspiration to me. And it was just so amazing that, you know, we connected. I think we were talking about doing something for probably a year before anything actually happened, probably more than that. And when we finally 
put it together. It was so lovely to see all these amazing different makers in one space and everyone's style was completely different. And yes, we all had a version of a spoon, but it didn't mean that we were in competition with each other. It was just incredible to see the range of talent and you know what 20 different people can do with this you know a piece of wood was amazing it's so much better to have that community than to have the competition because we're all on the same boat we're all on a similar path and yes there may be times when one person gets a job that the other person could have got but yeah I I loved it and the fact that we could get I mean at the time when people could come to visit (laughs) the last one we did was at uh, we joined forces with Turning Earth the pottery studio in Hoxton in East London Um, so uh, we joined their Christmas uh, market so we had an archway of our own and it was incredible we had people making in there there was you know wood scattered all across the floor wood chips everywhere and it was just so nice to see all this range of incredible work. Do you think there's a growing appreciation for artisan products? And I think it has been sped up by the pandemic. But just generally, do you think that as the world's getting faster, we are actually appreciating things that are made slowly? Yeah, I always say that sort of in the world of Amazon, you know, everything is available now and my products aren't always available. I think I normally do about six shop updates a year. You know, I always say that, you know, trees take so long to grow. Why rush it? Especially with the pandemic, people are now more willing to wait. And that appreciation is sort of so valuable. I mean, every morning I'll have coffee in my favourite handmade mug and it's sort of an appreciation for the maker as well so it's sort of you know that small moment of this person's made this item so much time and energy has gone into making this item and I'm so you know it the fact that it brightens up my day Mm. when I something so trivial as a coffee cup you know it's like Mm. why can't we enjoy those small moments and I think you know since everyone's been locked inside we are really respecting those small moments and you know, why not? I couldn't agree more. I'm nursing my coffee with my favourite mug right now. And you too. Yeah, I got mine. (laughs) Um, I'm interested. You said you update your shop six times a year. Mm -hmm. So just tell me commercially how this works, because I obviously come from a world where I've seen some makers make slower and then speed up and then slight changes in how they want to create and make to become more commercial. But for yourself, is it about pricing your products correctly so that actually your time is priced correctly so that you are able to make to the standard that you want to make and that you don't give yourself ridiculous targets and that you are living the good life? Or Because I think this is something that a lot of small businesses... We don't talk enough about it. How are we developing our models so that we can retain quality, retain artisan, retain these things, but also make a living? It's important. I think if you're doing this as your job, you need to, you know, you do need to make money from it. You do need to be able to live off it. But um, I think I used to have my shop open all the time and, you know, it would always be, you know, just adding more and more to it and just found that it didn't work for my lifestyle. You know, I'd be you know, a week with not selling nothing and then put some new things up. And then I'd be at the post office like every few days and it just was getting a bit, it was disrupting my creativity, having to always be thinking about all these different channels. So when I started focusing more on making sort of small collections and I was able to not only like curate this selection of work, photograph it, but, you know, slimline that process of putting it all online at the same time and then packaging it all and going to the post office once rather than spreading myself too thin, trying to make this order, trying to make that order and it just being all over the place. By having fewer updates, it just allows me to really focus on making things, which is essentially why I'm doing this and to have that slower pace of life. And people do get annoyed that I get a lot of emails saying like, why can't I buy this? And I just have to say, look, I'm really sorry, it's not it's not available. And it's like, well, can you not just make me this one thing? And I have to, it's, you know, I have to say no, because it's just not how I want to work. And ultimately, I've made this business 
work the way I want it to and you know tough if you if you can't buy something when it's not available this is really important you've designed a career that works to your soul mm-hmm. Do you feel that you've been able to get to this place now because of Mm. that many years under your belt and that you know, when I launch six times a year, I know that that range will sell out and thus I know that is the income that I will get? Yeah. A few years ago, things weren't working. Things weren't going how I wanted them to go. And one of the reasons why was because I was spreading myself too thin and there was a time... I used to teach workshops as well. I think over the span of a few years, I taught over a thousand people to make spoons. Wow. That would be sometimes two workshops on a Saturday, two workshops on a Sunday, every week. And it was just too much. And then on top of that, I was creating work. I was trying to ship things out. And, you know, it's only me. So there's only so much I can do. But when I made the decision to stop teaching and to focus on, okay, well, that time I spent prepping for workshops, traveling to workshops and actually teaching. I'm now going to focus that on actually doing items that I want to make. That's when I sort of allowed myself the time to start being more creative. And that's when I first launched my range of brushes. And I think that was in um, January 2019. I launched my first range of brushes. And I remember I was on my way to an event. I'd set my shop to launch at seven o'clock and I was on my way to the event and we were on the tube underground. I think we were late leaving or something and we planned to be above ground when it worked. And then I was just sort of freaking out. You know, it wasn't something that I wanted to happen. But then when I got above ground, the whole thing had sold out in about 10 minutes. And I was just, I honestly, I, I like had to pull myself together before this event. I was like, I honestly can't believe it. But also, you know, that event was an event for... Um, Squarespace, my website platform, because I'd done a project with them the year before they invited me to, and it was at Abbey Road Studios. <laughs> so I was like, on my way to Abbey Road Studios for an amazing event by my website platform. I've just sold out my first ever collection in 10 minutes. I was on top of the world. Like, I couldn't believe it. I was like, this is amazing. Like, you were having your very own Beyonce moment. This is it. That was this it, honestly. It. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so, you know, from then I was like, okay, I, you know, I'm obviously onto something here. I've obviously got something that people appreciate and they like. So I was like, right, well, I'll just, you know, from here I'll start making small collections. And, um, In April, I launched my first ever pop-up shop and the space that I won through the Space for Ideas campaign with Appear Here. And that was, again, amazing. Such an incredible boost for my business. And the first time I was ever able to invite people in. So normally everything I do is online and everything I do, you know, you have to wait for that product. But actually being able to get my customers in and see Mm -hmm. what they respond to was, oh, it was invaluable. It was really incredible. It has taken you time. This has not been a sort of, you know, you started doing this, you only decided to sell six times a year and you had complete sellouts every single time. Mm -hmm. That was not your journey. But you have got to a point now where you have tested enough things that you know that this should sell. Yep. And I suppose it's you'll learn every single time that you launch that collection, right? It's really interesting. Obviously, I'm in an incredibly lucky position that whatever I make will sell. And, you know, I don't really know how I've got here. Like it has just been, it's not been luck because I know I've worked incredibly hard and, you know, I'm in year eight now. So it's not been a quick turnaround. Mm, And I have made a lot of sacrifices along the way. I've not gone on holiday certain, you know, I've, I've missed out on those social events and I've not done certain things, but that's absolutely fine because you're happy and you've got what you've got. I'm interested that you You've spoken a couple of times during this interview about different things that you've done. So Carve London, the pop-up shop. Mm -hmm. I know that the book is something that I'd love to touch on Mm, that. Yes. You've created in your own way a brand that can sit physically. It can sit within an event. It's going to be hopefully sitting within the written word. Do you think that that's an important thing to move a brand forward and to keep the founder alive. Yeah, it's the excitement, I guess, of always trying something that's new. But I guess, you know, yeah, like you say, it is nice that I am able to sit in those different worlds and you don't know who's in which category. And, you know, the more people that I can reach, the better. And the more people that can find enjoyment, they may not find 
enjoyment out of the items, but they might find enjoyment out of physically making the items. Mm -hmm. And I've always wanted to pass on my skills. That's one of the reasons why I started teaching. And I think the book is a way of being able to do that in a more controlled manner because I am very controlling of my work. So it's (laughs) a way of being able to you know, give little snippets of your life without giving away too much. Tell me about the book, because I know that hopefully your prize money might help you make that a reality. Absolutely. The book has been a concept for about four years now. It's something that I have gone to various publishers with and for whatever reason, it hasn't worked out. Going back to the fact that I am selfish, but I also think... You need to be, you know, this is my first ever book. It needs to be exactly how I want it to be. And I can't just slot into a category of, right, here's our formula, drag and drop your work into that. That's not, that's not me. It's, it's never been me. Yeah. But um, yeah, I've had this concept for about four years now and it's changed a lot, but I finally got it down and a publisher approached me in, I think it was December, 2019 and had loads of meetings back and forth. I got my proposal down and by end of Feb we were at the point of getting a contract and then obviously the pandemic hit and they decided not to go with it but it was a blessing in disguise because I wasn't 100% happy with the proposal it had changed a bit from what I wanted but I just thought that was the right thing to do at the time and actually having a bit of time to sit you know whilst doing not a lot realized that actually I want more control of it I want to be able to do more of what I want to do so although you know I lost this amazing contract it was actually it was fine. So with, you know, the fact that I won this incredible award, which I <laughs> still can't believe, just means that I can I can do it myself now. And it is without giving too much away no, of the book, but it is, <laughs> it's, it's a long project. So it's, I mean, at the moment I've been speaking to various people, you know, about getting the ball rolling with it, but it's, it, you know, it probably won't be out until Christmas 2022. Yes. It's a long book and I know that it, I know what I'm like. It needs to be perfect. The amount it's changed over the last four years when I've, I've probably written about half of it already, but I know that there's certain elements of it that related to nature that there's only certain times when I can shoot snow or there's only certain times when I yes. can shoot certain things. So yes. the fact that my work is slow, I don't feel the need to rush it. And I think one of the things that was an issue with the publisher was that I was going to have to produce it within three months. That didn't work for me. I love that you've turned it into a positive. I love that your prize money will help <laughs> you do this. And and, oh, and, and I, I think that one of the things that I've learned from you and actually just knowing of your business, it's always been something I've referenced during the building of Holly & Co. And is this element of slowness There is a resurgence happening. There absolutely is. And I think with mental health now being more at our forefront of our minds, I think we've got an appreciation. I mean, firstly, we talk about it. Gosh, we only have to go back X amount of years. We never used the word mental health. We never spoke about it. You know, and I do think that now that is going to actually infiltrate industries. It's going to infiltrate the way that we buy. It's going to be infiltrate the way we eat, the way we communicate. And I think that it's a, you've been a great sort of, not that you probably ever meant to be, but you are almost a great sort of poster woman for this. You know, that actually that a business can not only be phenomenal for your own mental health, as I truly believe it does make one happy to be in control of your life, but I think it does something else. And I don't know if you know that, but it sort of, it gives off this aura of slowness, which I think is a tonic for all of us. Has, have other people spoken to you about that? Yeah, this was one thing that I always really loved about teaching. I remember one quite stressful class that I had where I think it was a group of women, maybe five or six of them, and they were all friends and they hadn't seen each other for a little while. And they came in, everyone was chatting and, you know, what have you been up to? And it was really difficult to actually get the class started because I knew I had to be out of there within a certain time and um, finally managed to get them all into it. And within 10 minutes, everyone was silent. Everyone was working on their item and nobody spoke for three hours. Nobody spoke to each other. And at the end of it, they were just like, God, you know what? Like I had such a stressful week. I've had such a stressful few days and I didn't think of any of it. I've just been able to completely focus on making something. And they've been like, you know, I've never had that before. Like I have not checked my phone this whole time. I've not. Mm. So it's really nice that you can 
focus, especially now when you have so many screens around you and so many mm. different elements of, you know, shiny things and going back to something that is natural is really important. Having that connection with nature, you know, whether it be just, you know, a small piece of timber, it's it's so important. And I don't, don't think people realise until they do it yeah. how helpful it is. You know, I know how much it helped me. I don't think that if I hadn't have had such a traumatic few years with my family, I don't think I'd be doing this. Mm -hmm. I think I'd probably be in a job that I wasn't happy with. And you'll probably be caught in that job yeah. because you would have maybe created a lifestyle around what you were doing and exactly. very, very difficult to go backwards, isn't it? Exactly, to sort of yeah. stop everything. All year, together with our friends at Three, we're working to make business dreams come true. Share your dreams on social using the hashtag Holly and Co Dreamer, and who knows what will happen. Three understands it's been a tough time for businesses, so they're offering their business price promise. A promise that if you find a better deal, they'll beat it. Not only that, I love that they offer up to £500 of benefits from specialist partners to help your business thrive. Head to 3.co.uk forward slash terms for terms and conditions. Now, here's a short story about those that dreamed big and flew. Bill Gates said, To accomplish great things, we must not only act, but also dream. Not only plan, but also believe. Born in Seattle to wealthy parents, Bill was a highly competitive and intelligent child. He attended Lakeside School, and it was there that he met his future business partner, Paul Allen, and was first introduced to computers, sparking a lifelong interest in technology. His fascination continued during his time at Harvard, where he was studying to be a lawyer. But after dropping out of university after just two years, Bill went on to start a software company with Paul. The company was called Microsoft. Guided by the belief that the computer would be a valuable tool for everyone, they began developing software for personal computers. And throughout the 80s, Microsoft changed the face of computing. In the year 2000, Bill, with his wife, founded the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. To date, they have donated a staggering $36 billion to charitable causes, focusing on global health, education and poverty. Bill famously stated, The returns in investing in the poor are just as great as the returns in investing in the business world and have even more meaning. The man who changed our world today says we had dreams about the impact it could have. And now Bill's vision of a computer on every desk and in every home is a reality. And Microsoft remains one of the largest companies in the world. Don't forget to share your own business dreams on social using the hashtag Holly and Co Dreamer. And to find out more about their business plans, search Three Means Business. Now, back to Conversations of Inspiration. Tell me what the future holds for you, Sophie. Not only are we going to see something, even though you haven't given it away, yes. <laughs> I can see that you're taking photographs in the snow. Yeah, this is what I we mean... do know. So tell me what else are your dreams <laughs> for your business and for your life? One of the things I always say is I try not to make too many plans. I think... When I first started, I had to write a business plan and obviously I had an idea, but that very quickly went out the window. I've done things that I never would have dreamed of doing and never, ever would have even been in my plan at all. So even teaching wasn't in my plan. I shot some travel films a few years ago and like that was never in my plan, you know. It was, um, yeah, I, I like to keep things very open. I like to think that I'll just be continuing to develop my own personal style. One thing I'm starting to work on at the moment is some more sculptural work. So moving, mm. shifting slightly from the functional side of things to the more sculptural side of things. And um, I think ultimately the end goal would be to just have a beautiful home somewhere in the woods with a workshop and uh, six dogs. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> All your axes, you know, beautifully displayed. Yeah, on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what? I just, I'm very happy having a slow, considered life. I know that this isn't going to be 
um, you know, a multi-million pound business. That's not what I, I don't really care about that. Like as long as I can pay my bills and support myself and my family, that's the most important thing. And being able to be my own boss, do this at my own pace, you know, like if I don't feel like working one day, who am I letting down? Just myself. So yeah. it's yeah. just nice and slow. It's a beautiful thing. We were talking, I've had quite a stressful morning and we're talking to each other <laughs> as all my interviews at the moment on the computer because of the pandemic. But I was mentioning how stressful my morning had been before you and actually just being able to look at you and your beautiful spoons <laughs> all behind you. You've done exactly what you do when I look at you on Instagram. You've calmed me right down. Oh, so it's so lovely. <laughs> Glad to hear that. As I said, you're this calming influence. So I'd love you just to be on my screen all day long but I'm going to let you get back to fulfilling your pending orders shall we say I end the interviews with the analogy that running your own business is like being on this epic roller coaster your cart would be carved beautifully out of wood and I can imagine how glorious you would look in your wooden cart tell me what's been one of the lowest of the lows when that roller coaster cart dipped I think a few years ago, I completely burnt out. I was just doing too much. And like I said, I was teaching all the time, but it was also quite difficult because my work is really physical. And I got to the point where I'd wake up most mornings with just the most severe pain in my wrists, in my hands, in my shoulders. And it just got to the point where I was thinking, I don't know how long I can physically do this for. Like, I can't keep this up. So that was a pretty low point, just trying to, you know, reevaluate what I wanted. But from that, I was able to, you know, decide to stop teaching, decide to focus on various other aspects and take things back to where I wanted them to be. So I think it's, um, it got to the point where it sounds silly, but it was work. Yeah. And up until that point, it had never really been work. Yeah. So um, it was taking it back to it not being work that was um, important for me. That's a really great lesson. Many companies I've spoken to where they loved what they did and then they fell out of love with it. Yeah. And it's at that moment in time where actually you say, should I give this up? You need to then to say, uh-uh, I just need to rework. What was it that I loved? Mm. And get right back to that. That's the thing, isn't it? That's almost what you did. You know, let's get back to the basics again. Let's go yeah. back to what it was and why I started this business. And it's great to hear that you didn't give up and you've gone on to great success. And then conversely, your high... Uh, well, I think you'll you know what I'm going to say. It's a fairly recent one, to be honest, but winning the first ever Modern Crafter Awards, <laughs> <laughs> the Independent Awards in 2020. What an excellent way to end the year. Like, it's just been... Not only was it an amazing evening, like I had the best time, I had a bit of a sore head the next day. But yeah, me too. Just, <laughs> just <laughs> knowing that it gives me that bit of freedom to do things in my own way and just the validation that, you know, what I am, I am on the right path and that I am doing things that people love. Like, it's just, honestly, it's been so amazing. And the fact that, oh, yeah, I don't, I can't even put it to words. It was just absolutely amazing. And I know Jay Blades was the judge in your category and the words he had to describe you and the amount of public vote and everything. It was just, what a night that was, wasn't it? It, it was, was just an incredible moment. And how bizarre that we were, you know, normally that would have been physically, you know, we would have been together. Yeah, no. But we all we managed to do this, this remotely <laughs> yeah. and still all have sore heads, all have a great time, but it was just the bizarrest thing. And it was such a success. Oh, it yeah. really was. Well, I'm so pleased. That, what, what a moment for me, for that oh. to be your high. As I said, Sophie, I've had just such the most loveliest of conversations with you, and I know that everyone would have learned a lot from this, but it's that time of the podcast now where I'm going to hand over to you to read a letter that you've oh, prepared yes. to the oh, little God. Sophie uh, <laughs> with your crafting pot. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a, a moment where I take off my glasses and I hand over to you, but bless you for being with us today. Oh, thank you so much. I think it's um, it was quite daunting, I'm not going to lie, seeing the, the names of the people that you've normally had on before. I was sort of like, I don't know why I'm here, but it's, <laughs> it's so nice chatting well, to you. <laughs> everyone listening knows why you're here. Everyone knows. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Oh, bless you. Dear Sophie, you are exactly where you're supposed to be. Keep going. Everything works out in the end. I know how much you long to hear these words. 
There will be times that it seems like you're not on the right path, but everything you're doing is absolutely necessary to your future success and happiness. It's okay to be different. You've grown up in an environment where you are the odd one out and you won't believe it now, but you have an incredible understanding of life that others will never experience or understand until they are older. Embrace your weirdness and obsessions. Run with them with everything you have, like I know you will. Trust your gut and learn to say no to things that you don't want to do. There will be times when it seems like you're missing out, but I've been there. You aren't missing anything. Don't wait so long to shave your hair. You will regret it at the time, but it's the catalyst to understanding your self-identity and embracing your heritage. And don't worry, mum will get over it, just like she got over the endless piercings and tattoos to come. Look after mum and dad. We have a rough ride as a family, but we get through it and come out stronger the other side. They have given you all the tools you'll need to succeed. Your kindness, determination and work ethic are valuable lessons learnt from them and I am forever grateful to them for it. There will be times when it feels like you are doing everything wrong, but try not to be in your own head so much and enjoy the present. There are just some things you can't control. Stop trying to please everyone. Those worthy of your time will be around for the long haul and support you in almost everything you do. Those who aren't will only hold you back from reaching your full potential. You will lose your way a few times, and that's okay. Mistakes are meant to be made. Spend as much time as possible learning and exploring. I know how much you love being in nature. Your ability to engage with and be aware of your surroundings is one of your strongest attributes. I wish I still had your unwavering self-belief and ability to throw yourself into any situation. Trust yourself, love yourself, and be grateful for all you have. I am really proud of how far you have come all the challenges you will overcome in the future and the support you gave your family when they needed it the most. But your older self still doesn't have the answers and still isn't quite yet an adult. You are still really clumsy and you still talk to yourself a lot, but you get to spend your time being creative, which I know you will enjoy. So you have that to look forward to. We end up making a career out of our favourite DT lessons. So make sure you take in every moment as I'd wish I'd paid more attention at the time. And lastly, one thing to look forward to is that you finally get your four-legged companion and he's the best friend and best decision you've ever made. <laughs> You're just such a joy. No. You really, <laughs> you, really Ollie. are. And I think, you know what? I think everyone after this podcast, if they don't have one of your spoons, firstly, you're going to get more orders. <laughs> but secondly, they're going to look at the spoon that they stir something with tonight or whenever they're listening and they're going to think of you <laughs> and they're going to think of how far you've come and that you're just a great example to us. And I, as I said right at the beginning of this podcast, I love the fact that you're going to be doing this for 50 years mm. and I can't wait to see how your career blossoms and how your brand just takes off even more. Your joy. Thank you. Thank you, Holly. That's really kind. Yeah, I can't wait either. We'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. <laughs> Bless you. Before you go, if you've enjoyed this episode, if it's helped you along your journey or inspired you, would you mind rating and reviewing? Your support means the world to me. It really does spread the word and will help inspire even more people to build a life they love. With thanks to NatWest, who have helped bring this free podcast to life. And if you want to hear all our latest news, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter, Holly's Desk Notes, over at holly.co.